Hello everyone, Bobbin here. Welcome to episode 24 of my Factorio C Block series, where I'm having a whole lot of resource problems right now and I've got to do something about it. Let's talk about research first so I can sort of get into what I'm going to be doing on that and we'll go from there. The research that was finished since the last episode was advanced gas processing, oil steam cracking, gas steam cracking 2, advanced chemistry 3, synthesis gas processing, personal roboport, and sniper turrets 2. All of them except the last two were involved in setting up some petroleum processing that I am going to show you in this episode. But first, let's go ahead and start a new research that involves metals processing. I want to do chemical refining. This will open up crystallization of our angels ores so that we can get more products from them. Including, in particular, we would like to get titanium because that will allow us to continue to progress. Titanium is going to be necessary for some of what is coming. So let's begin that research and we'll go back in there and take a look at what else is coming up that I need to work on. I am also needing to work on Advanced Glass Smelting 3 because I'm having a little bit of a problem with lead. We've been using this Advanced Glass Smelting 2 which uses molten lead and molten glass to produce glass and lead oxide. Unfortunately I have a backup on lead and that's going to start blocking things if I don't do something about it. And every time that this accumulates a big pile of lead oxide, I have to go manually pick it up because I'm not doing anything automatically with it. If I did do something automatically with it, it would still back up because of the way that the lead is working. The Advanced Glass Smelting 3 has the benefit that it uses, first of all, it uses tin instead of lead, but it cycles the same tin over and over again. I don't have to go and re-smelt it. The only expendable material here in this process is some nitrogen gas, which I can just pull out from the air. It also is more productive of glass. So I'm going to be switching my glass production to this as soon as I get that researched between episodes. Another one that I am particularly wanting to do soon is Logistics 3. Logistics 3 will open up the third tier of, of belts, the blue belts, I can't really afford the iron for the blue belts yet, but it also opens up some additional stuff as we go along. I don't know what this advanced research is, or well, at least alien stuff. We're not going to be doing that, but we also get some inserter upgrades. Additional long inserters, which will reach three blocks instead of two. And what was the other one here? More inserters too. This gives more angles that you can pick things up and drop things off at. So that'll give us some advantages, but in particular I do want to get these because there will be a few situations where I think they'll be useful. Unfortunately right now I just don't have the iron production to support making a lot of fast belts, but we are getting there. Another one I want to look at is I want to look at Solar Energy 3. This will allow me to produce a solar panel that produces 90 kilowatts instead of the default 60 kilowatts. I am going to start using some solar in the base. This base is not going to be primarily powered by solar, but what will happen is instead of instead of making everything solar panels and accumulators, I'm going to skip the accumulators and the solar panels will just be used during the time that they're active to reduce fuel consumption and then it will be other methods of producing power that kick in during the day to keep things active. I think that's going to work out pretty well for me. The other thing that this uses is silver plates. I have plenty of silver ore. I'm not making plates yet. I am going to be making silver plates soon because some other research that's coming up pretty quickly is this purple. And I don't think this is the one. I think it's maybe this one. Uh, some of these use silver. This one uses silver plates in its production. So I'm going to have to be... I'm going to be making these two purple science packs pretty soon, I think. The yellow one is, getting, is a while out. The yellow one requires some additional materials and there's just no practical way of 
doing that at this point. So the other research I want to start really soon is some of the module research. The module research has a completely different set of components and a different set of labs, but we're going to be able to produce it, I think, in the short term in the same building that's doing robots. Let's look at robot changes for a minute because I have cleaned up my robot facility here. The first thing I did was I moved the ferric chloride outside. It's no longer in the building. It's just being produced out here. This production area is using a salination plant, which is a building I haven't used before, but I am using it now. It produces saline in much greater quantities and also has the advantage over the hydro plant that it doesn't produce purified water as a side effect of doing that, so I don't have to set up a hydro plant, which actually has a larger footprint than this, and a clarifier and power them both and dispose of the energy. So it takes less space. I think it takes less energy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does, especially since it doesn't run as often, since it's not producing as much stuff. And it'll give me overall a higher capacity for producing my ferric chloride. Going into the building here where the robots are being made, it has been organized a lot more and it is not... Um, it's just not taking as much floor space and, and it's laid out a little better. It's still not what I would consider to be some great layout. Certainly nothing for high throughput. But I don't really think I'm going to need high throughput on robots. Robots are something that uh, if I had a million of them, I would need high throughput to, to produce that. I don't know if Factorio can handle a million of them, but I know my computer can't. So. There's no way I'm producing that many robots, so I don't need that sort of production for it. Essentially, I have lined things up a little better. I'm now producing all of the components that are necessary for the construction robots as well. So we do have a building here that produces construction robots, and I have told it to make 50 of them, so we've got 50 of them in there. The other thing that's going on with that is I did go ahead and research personal RoboPort as part of the research between episodes. So I have a personal RoboPort and I've got 10 construction robots and I've been using that instead of the nanobots. The nanobots are faster. Honestly, I, th I think they kind of work a little better, especially since they don't require power. That will not always be true. Eventually I will get upgrades on all of my robots and I'll be able to get better use out of the robots. In addition, of course, construction robots can work from RoboPorts instead of from, from me, so I will have robots doing construction. That's actually going to happen in what, what I'm calling Base 2.0 right now, which is still in the planning stages. I've done a little bit of work with it. It's not a ton, but I have sort of thought about how I'm going to lay out the rails and the blocks and get that working a little better, and I'm still in the testing stage on it. Okay, I got chemical refining finished. I'm actually going to do all of these ore production ones. They all require just blue science in order to complete. So I think I'm going to get all of the ore processing completely done. There will still be lots of metallurgy and other sorts of stuff going on, and I can't actually build the final buildings immediately, but I will have all of the recipes available to me when I do get the necessary materials for the buildings. Let's go for the glass smelting. We'll get that researched. Okay, let's take a look at what I did with petroleum processing between episodes because I did quite a bit with it. So this is the same building you saw in the last episode where I had sort of the prototype set up. I have made it much more organized now, at least within this building, and you can see that there are robots flying around everywhere delivering materials and so on. You would think with all of those robots going on that this was producing a lot of petroleum products. It's really not. This is really a pretty small system. Unfortunately, when it comes to Angel's Petrochemicals, you really can't say anything is a small system. So what's going on here? If we visit these buildings, there are eight of these buildings. Let's start with the one in the corner up here. This building is where it is producing sulfuric wastewater. It also produces acid gas as a side effect of that. It processes the acid gas including acid gas brought in from other buildings and makes it into sulfur, carbon dioxide, and hydrofluoric acid is the other product. Okay, so that's what's going on in this building. It's really just focused on sulfuric wastewater and acid gas. Looking at the next building over, 
This building is where the oil is actually being produced. Here we're using blue algae to do multi-phase oil production like you've seen before. Steam is coming in from outside. Uh, it's producing supplemental carbon dioxide from charcoal as it needs it. The building is set up to prefer to use carbon dioxide from outside. But we go through here, we produce the oil, we separate it, all of the sulfuric wastewater that's generating in here from both the oil production and the oil separation is recycled. So that never leaves this building, it just comes in and never leaves. We're separating raw gas, we get acid gas from that, that ends up getting shipped to the other building when the robots get around to it. So this building is mostly producing crude oil, but it also exports acid gas. The next building in the production chain is actually not just continuing to follow around. It's this one that I'm standing next to and that I've got highlighted. This one is where crude oil is refined. And there's really not a whole lot going on in this building. It's just got an oil refinery. It, it takes barrels of crude oil in and it ships out barrels of naphtha, fuel oil, natural gas liquids, and it also ships out the oil residuals. Now fuel oil isn't subject to any particular refining here. The building does not export fuel oil. What it does is it burns it and that's done in this building right here. In this building we're taking and bringing in fuel oil, unbarreling it, shipping the barrels out. The fuel oil itself is burned to produce either power or steam. And steam, all the steam that's used throughout this process is generated in this building and shipped out. The extra fuel oil is burned basically it's used to generate power this building exports power that partially offsets the power that would be coming in from outside otherwise the total amount of fuel oil is actually pretty small it's not small enough to run this full time so this building can't power the whole process the next building to look at is probably the most complicated one it involves processing natural gas what we're trying to do with natural gas here is to produce a combination of methanol and rubber. So this building has natural gas refining in it, but it also has rubber production and it takes all the products of the natural gas that are not really useful in the form that they're produced in, like ethane, and converts them into other materials. The ethane in this case goes to ethylene and is then used through the whole production chain for rubber. The methane that comes from the natural gas is being converted into methanol and shipped out because this particular factory doesn't export any methane. It takes all of the methane and just converts it into methanol and then eventually into chemical laser flash fuel or plastic depending on how much methanol there is. So it's a very complicated building inside here. We've got this main building up here which is the gas refinery. This one is the advanced version. I've set it up with a recipe that produces more of the heavy products and less of the methane and the reason for that is to actually get more rubber out of this process. The total amount of natural gas liquids that's produced is really pretty small out of this oil process but it produces residual gas, the residual gas is recycled, that sort of thing. We're going through here through a bunch of steam crackers, there are four of them. One of them is cracking naphtha as which is actually coming from outside. It's not part of natural gas processing. The others are doing the natural gas components. And then further down here, we have a whole rubber production chain going. And over here, we're making, we're taking the methanol that's coming from this cracking process and just shipping it out. So one of the key technologies that I researched between episodes was synthesis gas processing. In truth, synthesis gas processing makes most of what happens in this building obsolete because we could just produce synthesis gas and produce most of these fractions or we could take something like the fuel oil or base mineral oil that's coming out of our vegetable process refining the vegetable oil that we're using for fuel for the power plant we could take that and do most of this chemistry with it at some level there are a few things you can't do that way but at the moment we could probably do most of it we are missing a catalyst that would be needed for that because we can't make the blue catalyst yet because we don't have titanium. That's one of the things we're going to be getting from the crystallization technology that happened just a short time ago. Before we go in this building and look at what's going on with synthesis gas, let's pick a, a new research. 
For our next research, let's look at advanced ore refining three. We don't need really the, the new flotation cell and we can't make it anyway. We can't make the leaching plant mark two. We're held up by not having titanium, not having concrete reinforced bricks, and not having processing units yet. So we can't make most of, the, actually we can't make any of these machines. Conceivably though, we might be able to make some of the recipes here. So this will get us the option of making the hybrid catalyst and it looks like we'll be able to use crystallized ores in various combinations to make uranium, silver, cobalt, gold, and titanium. I am going to be using these catalyst recipes. They're probably never going to be the exclusive source of metals, but I will use them to basically balance everything up. And we're going to talk a little bit about balancing production in a little bit, but it will be nice to have these so we'll be able to do that. Okay, heading into this building and looking at what we're doing with synthesis gas. In here, we're taking extra residual gas in this one. We're taking extra, we're taking our oil residuals in this building, and we're taking our base mineral oil in this building, and it's all being converted into synthesis gas. The synthesis gas is sort of a global conversion medium, if you want to think of it that way for the petrochemicals. It's not truly global. You can't actually do everything with it, but you can get a lot of the base materials out of it and you can convert a lot of the materials that you have in excess into it. So we have that advantage here. In this building, it's only being converted into methanol. So we're going to ship out methanol out of this building. It's possible that if enough of it came in at once, that it could overflow and then it would try to make solid fuel out of it. I don't think this building has ever activated because I've never had enough stuff coming in at once to do it. It's mostly becoming methanol. So heading off to the next building over here, if we have too much methanol, we can't necessarily convert it quickly into chemical laser flash fuel. So what I'm doing with the extra methanol is I've got a small plastic plant in here that will take the extra methanol, convert it into plastic, and ship it out. The final building over here is for storage of excess materials. Most of the oil going in here is ultimately processed into something, but it's extremely difficult to close the loop on this stuff in Angels, and you inevitably have byproducts of some sort that you've just got to deal with. In this case, the major byproducts being produced in this plant, which are produced in very small quantities at the end of the process, are toluene a slight excess of hydrofluoric acid, and benzene. These are the end chemicals that I just, I don't have anything to do with them yet, but periodically I will go and pick up all the barrels as they fill up and dump them in here and put them in tanks, storage, mostly just to get the barrels back so that the process can continue because if all the barrels get filled with the waste product, then it stops. I have not automated this. That's certainly an option to automate it, but in truth, the way that these are generated, it's pretty slow, so it hasn't come up as a great need yet. Down here, outside of the buildings, we're making chemical laser flash fuel. This takes naphtha and methanol and produces chemical laser flash fuel that's exported. So in summary, what this building is doing is it's producing oil internally. It never ships out any oil. The products that it does ship out are chemical laser flash fuel, rubber, sulfur, and a small amount of plastic. That's all that leaves this building. Other than that, it's basically, it's not really a self-contained system. It does have inputs over here. It's got to deal with things like fuel and limestone and catalyst metals and some charcoal. That's all that's coming in. But it's taking those inputs and it's producing those other outputs. And it's sort of slowly going around. This building can also eat extra chemicals that, that it processes that I, don't have a use for. I went ahead and took all of my big tanks that were sitting out here doing full of petroleum and all of the ethylene that was there, all of the naphtha, all of the fuel oil, all of the base mineral oil that was sitting in big tanks here, I just barreled up and brought into this building and eventually it was processed. I had to do it in several batches. I could take the base mineral oil from the power plant and put it in here. I don't think this building has the capacity to handle it all. 
the thing to keep in mind on this building is that this is really sort of a prototype, a temporary facility. It produces things that I'm going to be needing in the short term, but it's by no means on the sort of scale it will need to finish the game. It, it's just being helpful right now. It turns out that since the last episode, I've produced a, over 20,000 chemical laser flash fuel. So it it's slow. There's been a lot of time since the last episode. This building is slow, but it is producing more than I need for the moment. So I'm in good shape there. Let's move on to the next research. How about... Can't do the module research yet because I don't have the building. Uh, don't need the cement. Well, the cement processing would get me the reinforced concrete brick. Let's go ahead and do that because I'm going to need this for some buildings and it's a pretty quick research. So the next thing I want to talk about is probably the most important thing in this episode. I have had a, an epiphany, if you will, a revelation about this system that's doing the geode processing. This system is basically wrong. It's predicated on something that isn't really true. And here's why. This idea that I had for going and taking the high value geos and slurrying them and crushing the rest is a good idea and it's true. The whole premise of this plant is good if what you're producing is crystal slurry for the purpose of making catalysts or gem ores or something like that. That's fine. The problem is that's not what this is producing. What this is producing is actually mineral sludge for the purpose of making metal ores. And for that purpose, this is all just wrong. So the reason it's wrong is because of the recipe that this is using, the filtration units. The filtration units are converting crystal slurry into mineral sludge. And unfortunately, in that process, one of the inputs is mineralized water. And I didn't really account for what was going into this mineralized water in order to do it. I knew that I was producing extra, and of course, obviously, I knew I was producing it. I've got a big tank over here doing it. I'm, I'm taking and melting down all this crushed stone. I've got slag coming in and being crushed. And it's the slag coming in and being crushed that's the problem, because that's just the wrong way to process slag altogether. Here's what's going on. Let's suppose for a minute well, let's compare this process. Let's compare this process to what's going on where we're processing the slag. In processing the slag, it would be a little different from this recipe, but we're going to take five slag in, and we're going to take 15 sulfuric acid, and we're going to take and we're going to get 50 slag slurry out. And what's going to happen with that slag slurry is I'm do doing coal filtering, and I'll mention something about that in a minute. But if we do the coal filtering on it, we're going to get 50 mineral sludge out that we can use to crystallize. The difference between going from crystal slurry to slag slurry is this mineralized water. The slag slurry uses purified instead of mineralized here. So what's going on in the filtration afterwards is it's going to be taking the filter and the slag slurry and... In the case of the slag process, it's going to be using 100 purified water. And purified water is relatively cheap. Mineralized water, not so much. Uh, because what happens is if you compare this whole process looking at the slurrying and the filtration, the difference between the recipes is that this one requires mineralized water and the other one requires purified water. And if you were to go and compute the value of this mineralized water, if you were to assume that you were getting it all from crushing slag, it takes five slag to produce that much mineralized water. The same as what you would get just slurrying it down here. And that means that the geodes coming into this process are adding nothing to the process of producing the mineral sludge they have effectively zero value for this process because you could view it as processing slut or processing slag into mineral slurry either way 
one way of doing it you don't use geodes the other way you do use geodes and you get the same products out at the end of the process that's a problem the better way to view this is you're viewing this as the geodes enable you to convert mineralized water into mineral sludge and if you view it that way then it becomes a way to recycle all of your crushed stone and your mineralized water that's coming out as a waste process and from that perspective it does have value so I'm not going to be tearing all this down I'm going to go ahead and leave it like it is now but we will do it differently in base 2.0 the key thing is it's going to be looked at more as a process of recycling material rather than as a process of primary production the primary production for minerals I'm pretty sure at this point will still be done using slag but I will have a geode set up like this I'll crush all of the geodes not just some of them and that geode production process will be used just as recycling for crushed stone and for mineralized water and it will substantially enhance our mineral output there's no doubt about that because I will have a lot of those waste products but doing it this way for primary production is not the right way to do it now for primary production this is the right way to produce crystal seedling for making catalysts and for making gem ores eventually so there will be a system like this that does that but it won't be doing my main production for my mineral ores and so I'm gonna to have to rearrange a few things in particular one thing I set up a while back was I realized that my mineralized water wasn't always holding up if we come up here to the top I've actually added some more machines to make sure all this stuff gets slurried or gets um, converted into mineralized water but this tank is sitting pretty close to empty right now and what I found was that it was getting completely empty and so what I needed to do was I needed to put some more slag into this process to generate mineralized water and I had a belt down here that was doing that just diverting some from here obviously that's not the way to do it now that's basically spinning your wheels but what I did was I wired it up using the circuit network so that if the amount of mineralized water was less than 20,000 it allows slag to go up in here and if it was more than that then I don't allow that I'm gonna have a wired setup like this but what it's going to be looking at is it's going to be looking at the amount of at the moment I don't have any in here it's going to be looking at the amount of crystal dust in this container right here and it will be starting or stopping this belt with all the geodes coming through and this belt with the slag coming up I'll just remove all together and, and all that slag can go over to the original slag slurring operation so that's what I learned on this and I crunched up all the numbers and found that that was basically what needed to happen and so I'm not going to be tearing all this down and changing it in some major ways but I'm not going to be bringing any slag in here all the slag will go to primary production I'm going to go ahead and not bother crushing all the geodes right now but I will still be crushing most of them so I'm, I'm not changing this much it still has value but it won't be built like this in the next base the next iteration of this will not work like this so a word on ceramic versus coal filtering on this it's pretty bad if you do coal filtering if assuming that you're crushing slag to get your mineral water but leaving that aside for the moment just looking at it as a recycling system where you're getting full value from it the question might come up should I do coal filtering or should I do ceramic filtering ceramic filtering is a lot easier to do in some ways you don't have to run the charcoal through but in fact it's a disaster from a production viewpoint if you look at what happens with your mineralized water on that and remember it's really mineralized water that we're converting to minerals here not geodes if you look at what's happening to your mineralized water if you use charcoal filtering and you look at how much sulfuric wastewater comes out and how much mineralized water that corresponds to and deduct it from what went on and do all that you are basically getting for every 50 um, sludge that you get out of this system it's costing you 92 mineralized water that's using 
charcoal filtering. If you use ceramic filtering, you can do all the same math and calculate it up. I'm not going to go into it in great detail here, but if you do, what you should find is that you're that it's costing you 137 mineralized water in order to get one piece of ore out of this in, in terms of your mineral sludge. That's 50 mineral sludge. And the reason it's so much worse is because this recipe in here uses 100 mineralized water regardless of which kind of filtering you use and the output is lower for the ceramic filtering. In some other ways, the ceramic filtering looks a little better, but not here. Here you want to use charcoal filtering. Okay, so what do I need to do immediately to fix a problem that I have with this that doesn't relate to anything I just discussed? There is a problem, and I'm going to deal with it. Let's go down here and take a look. So this pipe right here is the pipe that's bringing the mineral sludge over from the other system. And I've had a problem for a while, and I've just been sort of fixing it up by hand, but I want to stop fixing it up that way because it's it's just really nasty. I'm going to put a pump in here and a tank in here and I'm going to do a little bit of wiring in the circuit network to better control what's going on here because I've had a problem. This system has two stable states. In one stable state there's very little sludge in the system like, the, like right now and in that state sometimes the sludge doesn't even make it all the way to the end of the line of crystallizers. I think it might be right now. No, it's not. So we're not producing any of this jivalite off at the end, and we're probably not producing very much rubite. So that is curtailing some of our mineral production. A pump will help that if we get the, if we're producing enough sludge. The other thing, the reason that's doing that way is because the other state is to have those completely jammed full and if they're completely jammed full then I am having geodes back up in the other system. I'm gonna fix the geodes separately. I've already said I'm gonna take that conveyor belt and I'm gonna activate it only when there's a shortage of crystal dust basically. But with that said, whenever that happens I have to turn off this or that warehouse will fill up with geodes and I don't want that. So right now we've got two of these machines running and we could have more. Obviously I want this to be primary production so I'd like to have all of these machines running as much as possible. Let's go ahead and switch this over and go ahead and fire up these machines. It's not going to fix the sludge anytime soon but it will eventually. Let me go ahead and make a pump. I think I've got some tanks in my inventory already. I just want to use the small petrochemical tank. Uh, pump. Pumps are here and I don't need a good one. A small pump will do. Alright, while that pump is making, actually it's already done, but let's go ahead and put in... Uh, make a space for a tank here, I think. And I'll put a tank in. Right there. And I'm going to go ahead and pull this loose and I'll put the pump in right there. And it is going to need power. Apparently my power poles don't reach quite this far. That's fine. We'll just put one here. Okay. So this pump will actually help ensure that we're actually moving stuff down the line. And that, that we're not accumulating stuff in tanks. One thing that I've noticed happens with tanks sometimes is that if the tank is nearly empty, the flow rate in the outgoing pipe, if you don't have a pump, tends to be regulated by the percent full that the tank is. So if a tank is nearly empty, you may have a very slow flow rate out of it. That's not desirable at all. We don't want that. Okay, so what am I going to do with this? Well, I need to run some wires, and so maybe I shouldn't have used this power pole because I'd like to use some bigger ones. Let's do this power pole, and I'll move it down just a little bit. We want it to be able to reach the tank. So we'll go there. Um, yeah, that's okay. It, it'll get power when I get a little further down here. Okay. So I've got wires run here, basically from the tank down to the conveyor. And what I want to do is I want to set up a circuit condition on all of these belts 
and I may not have enough red wires. Let's go ahead and make some more while this is going on. Where are red wires? Right there. Okay, so I'm going to connect the tank to this power pole and then across to this power pole. And from this power pole, I'm going to connect it to this belt. So now I've got backup on this belt. And what I want to do is I want to say, and this will be true even though this is not the primary production at this point, I want to say that I'm going to enable it if the amount in the tank is less than, and this is going to be mineral sludge, so we're going to pick mineral sludge, and the amount in the tank, the tank holds 20,000. Let's say if the amount in the, in the tank is less than 15,000, then we want to have this producing. Now, that's for this one, and all of them are maybe a little different. So why don't I put in another wire over here a little bit further down. Where is that? There to, it won't reach quite that far, to that one, to this one, and we'll put another one on this belt. And we'll do more or less the same condition. Can I copy paste that? I can. But this one is going to be if it's less than 12,000, let's say. OK, so what's going to happen now is the flow of material on this belt is controlled by the level of material in this tank. Normally, we're going to have a pump, so we're going to try to keep this tank as empty as possible. But if the tank is getting close to empty, and actually if it's half empty, we're going to go ahead and let more material through here. That's going to give the material coming from up here at geode processing priority in getting through here. And that's still how we want to do it, even though it's no longer our primary resource, because we want to look at the recycled material first before making new stuff. So that's what's going to go on there, and I'm going to do, between episodes, a little rearrangement so that I'm producing less mineralized water outside of this recycling context and sending more slag this way so that we actually have more mineral production going on in total. In order to use all of that, it re I'm actually hoping at some point that I will need to, without doing anything to increase my slag production, I'll be able to add another crystallizer or two. I'm not sure if that's the case, but if that happens, then that will be good news. I'm still probably going to end up adding some more electrolyzers and getting some more stuff in here. This is one place where I have upgraded belts to red belts at least part of the distance because I found that the liquefiers at the end of the line just weren't getting anything, even though it was, the belt was completely packed at the front. That's a circumstance where you want to upgrade your belt speed, so that's what I did. Let's look at the research again. Uh, I think the next research I want, let's go ahead and get... Do I want strand casting too? No, that doesn't get me anything but a better building. I could build that building, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. Let's go for coolant too. What this buys us is the ability when, we, when we're using coolant in conjunction with strand casting, which I'm planning on doing pretty soon, it gets us the ability to use ceramic filtering. This is one place where ceramic filtering is every bit as good as charcoal filtering, so we definitely want to use it here. So the last thing I want to talk about is this cellulose fiber and wood pellet production here using algae farms. This is the same setup we've been using since the beginning of the game. I've never had more than 12 of these farms producing green algae as part of this production line, but I think I want to change it. I've been looking at some of the other ways of doing it, and if we look at the Angel's Agriculture, there is one of the crops from the Temperate Gardens called Tianaton, something like that. It's, it's really a name that's hard to pronounce. Let's look up the seed. It's right here, and the way this works, this these seeds 
are used in conjunction with soil and water to produce this crop, which I am from now on going to call cotton because that's basically what it is. <laughs> it's producing cellulose fiber and you can also use it to produce more seeds. In fact, this is one that uses the seed loop. So let's do a quick analysis of what we're getting out of this. If you plant your seeds, it's going to take five seeds and you're going to get a crop on average of 50. Then you're going to use that 50 to produce new seeds to continue the cycle and it's going to produce on average five and a half seeds for 10 cotton that you put in. And if you do the math on that, that basically says that on average you're going to consume nine of these, to, nine of your crop to get seeds back, which means you're going from 50 to 41. If we look at the other recipe for this, the one that we're interested in, it produces cellulose fiber and it produces 11 cellulose fiber for 10 cotton. So if you put that in, you find that you get about 45 cellulose fiber for each production cycle on this. The nice thing about it as compared to these, uh, well first, if you compare that to what an algae farm produces, an algae farm produces basically the same amount on a per second basis of cellulose. The algae farm, however, requires more precious resources. In particular, some of your crop from the algae farm is recycled to make carbon dioxide to continue the process. And so if you look at that, you're looking at about, a, it's actually quite a bit, about a third of it goes back in to continue the cycle. So you're actually getting, losing a lot of your crop to having to produce carbon dioxide. Unless, of course, you have a waste source of carbon dioxide or you use some other source. With the synthesis gas stuff we've got right now, and conceivably we could produce carbon dioxide from oil, which comes from a wholly different process and you don't have to worry about it here, I don't think that really helps that much. Uh, the other thing is that it produces this mineralized water, and we could be using this mineralized water to produce ores and minerals. So I actually think that when, when you do the final analysis, producing the fiber from cotton is a better deal. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to grow cotton, in quotes, uh, to produce more fiber. And I'm going to set up a thing between episodes that does that. The way it's going to work, I believe, is I'm going to try to fit it in this same footprint so that eventually I can rip this out and plop in a replacement for it. That is not going to wait for base 2.0. I need the extra resources that I would get from it. It's going to look a little different. It's not going to be quite as nice, I don't think, but I'm going to try to make it as nice as I can and get it to fit in this same slot on the belt here and just be, make it a drop-in replacement for producing wood pellets. Wood pellets, you'll notice they're running full steam here. I am using more power. Uh, I had to refill this and I went and put another row of pellets in for storage. Uh, I kind of need to probably take and stop using the pellets and start using solid fuel. I just haven't seen a really pressing need for it because the difference is not that great. It's a little easier to produce some of the components for the solid fuel, of course, because oil can come from agriculture. So that's rather than these algae farms. So there's kind of an advantage to it. I just haven't done it. I did upgrade all of my steam engines down here to the Mark III's, Mark III boilers, Mark III steam engines, because I have those materials now. So I've gone from being 60% efficient on them to being 70% efficient. That's helping a little. I haven't had any actual brownouts or blackouts or anything, but what I have had is some funny looking little spikes in here. This is where the oil production stops and the steam production takes over. And I don't like that happening, but it's kind of inevitable with the way that I'm handling these tanks in here. I'm just having to come in here and manually break them whenever they fill up. And mineral oil happens quite a bit and glycerol somewhat less. I need to actually start using these for more. Haven't done it yet. Okay, so looking forward to what's continuing between now and the next episode, 
I am going to be setting up silver plates for this next tier of technology. I'm probably also going to be working some on module production, a little bit more stuff on the base 2.0 planning. Uh, if you look very closely at the mini map there, you can sort of see where I've got some rails laid out up top and I'm sort of planning how to design it. I have decided not to go with my original idea that I had hoped would work nicely and the reason is because I can't get the, the rail intersections in it are just too tight and so I can't signal them to get the sort of throughput I would like. I can always signal it to where only one train can use the intersection at, a one, at once. That means if one train is passing through the intersection, everybody else has to stop. But I don't want to do it that way. I want to have the possibility that non-interfering trains can actually pass one another in an intersection. So that's basically what's going on. There's going to be more research that gets done. I'm probably going to finish all that metal stuff. I may start looking at the next tier of science packs, and I may go ahead and set up module research. Until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.